Alright, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I haven't uploaded this channel in years, but uh, I find myself with an abundance of time on my hands, so I was going to uh, provide a short tutorial for brewing mead at home. Um, this is in no way a in-depth uh, tutorial or anything like that. This is only my second time doing it. Um, I thought I would uh, outline the basics though for anybody wanting to start at home and any trials or tribulations that I have had in my experience that uh, may be helpful to you. Um, so I'm just going to go over the basic materials you'll need to begin with. Um, so the most important thing uh, with fermenting anything, whether it's uh, kombuchas, meads, uh, wine, beer, is sanitization and cleaning. Um, there's a lot of really good products out there, such as um, Star Sand, which is like a one-step type sanitizing product that you just mix it with some water and then you sanitize all your stuff. Uh, however, I found a cheaper option is uh, using potassium metabisulfite, which let's see if it can focus here. Doesn't look like it will. But um, it's, uh, it, it can work as a sanitizing product in strong concentrations with water. That's what I've been using. Um, hasn't let me down yet. Uh, I know quite a few other people use it as well. It's basically uh, one teaspoon uh, per um, about two cups of water. And uh, you put all your stuff in that water, you let it sit for 10 minutes and it should be sanitized. Um, however, there's a lot of products you can use. It really comes down to uh, preference, I believe. Uh, if you guys have any better methods, please let me know in the comments. Um, you're going to need a scale. It'll be very helpful. Um, measuring cups, a funnel, uh, one cup measure cup. And then for this, I'm using three separate uh, measuring spoons. I'm using a half teaspoon, a one-fourth teaspoon, and uh, another half teaspoon. Um, you're going to want a thermometer, a mixing bowl, at least three pounds of honey. I'm using just some cheap uh, Kirkland brand here. Uh, you're going to want your yeast. This is Lalvin D47 yeast. There's a bunch of different types and it comes down to how strong you want your mead uh, and some other stuff. I just, I followed a uh, recipe online and it said D47 was what will work for it, so that's what I used. Then here I got yeast energizer, yeast nutrient, and potassium sorbate. Um, I'll leave a uh, recipe guide in the uh, description that says the exact measurements I used of everything. Uh, you're going to want a measuring cup of some kind. This isn't a very good one, but it gets the job done. Um, you're going to want a siphon. Uh, this is a one pump type thing where uh, you pull up and then it starts siphoning. It works. It works relatively well, really cheap, uh, and then a tube of some sort to obviously siphon stuff out. You're going to want spring water um, or any type of sanitized water, I guess. You're going to want your one gallon carboy here and your airlock. Here's a rubber stopper with a hole drilled in it. These are number uh, uh, size six stoppers. You're going to want a hole drilled in it that fits your airlock. But that is a basic overview of everything you will need to begin making meat at home. But anyways, let's get into sanitizing. So to begin, I've just filled our mixing bowl with uh, about 32 ounces of tap water. Um, that's about two cups, a little bit less than, or sorry, four cups, a little bit less than four cups. Um, I've just put it in my mixing bowl and I'm gonna add two teaspoons. Sorry, I forgot to mention I need a teaspoon. I had half teaspoons over there, but. Two teaspoons of our uh, potassium metabisulfite. This stuff really isn't good to breathe in. You can see a bit of dust here. It has chlorine in it, or sorry, not chlorine, but sulfur in it. So it uh, doesn't feel great to breathe in. Uh, so just be careful when you're working with that. Uh, anyways, just stir it up. And this will now be your sanitizing solution. So everything that comes in contact with our yeast or mead uh, will need to be sanitized. With potassium metabisulfite, you have to rinse everything, so we'll, we'll do that afterwards. I rinse it with spring water. I think you could do it with tap water, but it, I just find it safer to do it with spring water because you know it's sanitary that way. So everything that I'm using today, 
I'm going to sanitize. Um, here's our airlock and rubber stopper. I'm going to put that in. The airlocks are a bit tough. You got to wiggle them around to get the fluid in there. So I'm just going to pour a bit of this into here. Pour a bit into our one gallon carboy. Grab a lid. Put it on like that. Give it a good shake. And then let everything sit for 10 minutes. Anything that's coming in contact with your meat today has to be sanitized. Um, if you don't, you could either wind up with vinegar or botulism, which uh, both aren't good. I'm actually not sure if you can get botulism from it, but I know that uh, the risk is there. So. so I'm gonna let this all sit for 10 minutes and then we'll move on to uh, making the first part of our must today. Uh, just a quick side note. Um, a lot of these kits, when you get the carboy with the airlocks on them, they'll come with this type of top. Um, I haven't had good experiences with this type of top. I'm not convinced that it keeps a good seal. At least this one probably does with uh, right here, the inner circle, but there's no rubber lining on the inside of the cap. And I'm just not convinced that that's going to keep a good enough seal when it's capped on your bottle. Um, a solution to that is you can, you can buy a pack of these. I bought a pack of three airlocks, which came with uh, this right here. I bought a pack of three of these for, I think it was around $8. It's really quite cheap, um, just on Amazon. And uh, these work better. There, there are some issues with these, but I'll show you how they can easily be uh, solved here. Um, but yeah, just a, just a tip to save you some time. You don't want, you need a really good tight seal and you don't want a bad airlock. Okay, so it's been uh, 10 minutes now. Uh, all the metabisulfite is poured out of these two. Uh, it's in here now. Put that aside. So next thing you're gonna wanna do, this is important uh, because we are using high concentrations of potassium metabisulfite, is uh, rinse everything with uh, some sanitary water. Uh, I'm using the spring water here. Um, just pour it in, make sure everything gets rinsed well. With the airlocks, um, because it is, you have to kinda twist them to get everything out. I just tend to pour some spring water directly in it. Make sure it completely filters through. And with our jug, same thing, just pour in some spring water. And uh, same thing when we had the sanitizer in it, just give it a really good shake. Make sure uh, you get all that potassium metabisulfite off. All right, so that's nice and rinsed. I'm just gonna pour it back in here. And once everything has had a good rinse, go ahead and pour that out, and then we can begin to do measurements. All right, so we're gonna start adding our ingredients. Uh, you can hear in the background the water running. I'm running some extremely hot water into the sink, um, and then just letting the container of honey sit in that water to get it really uh, viscous, so it will pour easier and mix easier with our uh, fluids. Um, so to begin with, I'm just gonna fill it up about halfway to two thirds full um, with our spring water. We'll turn on our scale here, make sure it reads zero before we start pouring. Perfect, so you want it on pounds, if you have that option, otherwise you'll have to do some conversions. Uh, our honey is nice and warmed up. Okay, and we're gonna pour till we get to about three pounds. Now this is where it's really up to you. Uh, your mead can, really be uh, any amount of honey to water, depending on how sweet you want it to be, how much alcohol content you want it to be. Um, for the sake of this video, I'm just gonna do a steady three pounds. So I'm gonna pour in my three pounds of honey. And we can see the scale start to change. And three pounds. So I went a bit over, that's okay. Doesn't have to be exact. You're gonna wanna mix this gently. You don't wanna get, uh, well, actually, I, I'm, I've heard mixed stuff about this. I've heard you don't wanna let too much, too much oxygen in, but then other recipes will say to uh, shake it vigorously. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm just gonna give it a quick stir here to turn off our scale now. Yeah, you can see it sticks to the base there. So you're gonna wanna stir until you don't see that anymore. 
So uh, most of the honey is off the bottom there. Keep going a bit more. It's helpful to turn it upside down and do stuff, stuff like that. Okay, and then now we can go ahead and top off a bit more of our water. Just below the handle is uh, about a gallon. I'm not gonna top it up quite all the way yet because we still have to add our yeast and nutrients. Go to about there for now. All right, so the next step is to add our potassium metabisulfite to sterilize everything that is in this jug currently. Um, that being just the honey and water. Whenever you're using uh, unpasteurized honey or wild honey, um, or raw honey for that matter, you're most definitely gonna wanna use some potassium metabisulfite because uh, with this type of uh, alcohol that you're brewing, there is no boiling phase. Um, so that means that any bacteria that's in it at this phase will uh, be in there when the yeast gets put in there unless you do something to sterilize it. That's why it's really valuable to use uh, some potassium metabisulfite. It helps sterilize everything uh, for when you put your yeast in. It's about one-fourth of a one-fourth teaspoon or one-sixteenth of a teaspoon worth of meta, uh, potassium metabisulfite per gallon. I'm going to measure that out quick and I'm going to pour it in. This is probably the trickiest part of today's uh, part of the uh, brewing process. So anyways, I'll get that measured and then I'll add it in. And I'll just sprinkle that in. You'll see it diffuse in. Uh, and it should start sterilizing stuff right away. This is a very important step. Once you add your potassium metabisulfite, you can't add your yeast for at least 24 hours. It won't take off as well as you want it to. Um, at least that's what I've seen most uh, forums talking about mead specifying. Um, so just wait 24 hours. If you're really excited, I guess you could go ahead, but um, I'm going to keep this cap on it. You don't have to put an airlock on it yet. Nothing's, nothing should be fermenting at this point. Um, and I'm just going to put it aside for 24 hours, let it sanitize, and then when we come back tomorrow, I'm going to be adding my nutrients, my uh, energizer, and my yeast. And uh, this batch will be ready to start fermenting. We'll also top it off with the rest of the water. Um, and tomorrow's the fun part. You get to start seeing your meat actually take shape. Um, and one other point, it is at this point that if you wanted to add some spices, this is probably a good time to do it, at least from what I've seen on the internet talking about mead. There's three different points. You could technically add spices or fruits, but if you want it to be sanitized, this is a good point because if you add your spices uh, when you add your potassium metabisulfite, um, it'll sterilize it. But other than that, this batch is done for today. Gonna let it sit for 24 hours. We're gonna come back tomorrow and we're gonna finish it off. Uh, one last thing. Uh, I'm going ahead and sterilizing the rest of the equipment I'll need for tomorrow. Um, that being just uh, my thermometer here. Uh, I reused my uh, teaspoon to measure out the potassium metabisulfite, so I'm sterilizing that again. And then my funnel and my uh, one cup measuring cup. So if you wanna throw this in your initial sterilizing batch, you can totally do that. Um, I just did it because my bowl is not that big, so I'm doing two separate batches. Uh, but other, otherwise, this will be ready and sterile for tomorrow when we're uh, using it. All right, so it has been just over 24 hours since we put our uh, must aside to sterilize. Uh, we can add our yeast nutrient and our yeast energizer. Um, some recipes use one or the other. Um, I use both just to give it a really strong start. So um, today we're gonna be using our funnel, our measuring cup, our one cup measuring cup, our uh, thermometer, and some measuring spoons, as well as our airlock and stuff, but we'll get to that. Um, so to begin, uh, it may be different depending on your yeast, nutrient, and energizer. So just check on the label. This one says one teaspoon per gallon of must. Measure out one teaspoon. And just drop it in. It's okay if it gets on the side because you're gonna have to shake it anyways. And for our yeast energizer, it says half a teaspoon per U.S. gallon. And there we go, both are added. You could use your uh, 
funnel for that, but not really a point. And now we're just gonna give it a good mix. Yeah, so give it a good shake because the yeast energizer really likes to clump up here. You're gonna need a uh, pot to heat up your water in. Give it a good clean, sanitize it, and uh, just make sure that any surface this must is touching is entirely clean and sanitary. That is the uh, most important part of all of this. So once it looks pretty good, I might shake this just a bit more to get the last little bits. Uh, but once it's all completely dissolved in there, uh, we'll measure out a cup into this and I'll show that next. Okay, so hopefully you guys can see this, but uh, be sure to follow the instructions on your specific pack of yeast. I'm using Lalvin D47 here. Um, you can use varying types of uh, yeast. I know a lot of people use uh, champagne yeast to get a stronger alcohol content. Um, so just make sure that you're following the instructions on the back of uh, your packet um, or your bottle or whatever because those know the, uh, the best steps to get your yeast activated correctly. But I'm going to pour out about a cup of uh, my must into that, um, into this pot here and uh, then we'll activate it. So I'll bring you on over to the stove and we'll sh I'll show you how to do that next. Alright, so we have our a cup of uh, must poured into our pot here. Uh, make sure you have your sterilized thermometer. We, this specific type of yeast wants to be heated to 35 to 37 degrees Celsius or 95 to 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn my stove top on to extremely low. I'll put my thermometer in and keep a close eye on it until it is up to uh, 35 degrees Celsius. I've got this heated up to just above 35. Um, you want to make sure it's not too hot. Um, too cold doesn't kill yeast, but too hot does. If it's too cold, it just won't activate as well. If it's too hot, it'll actually kill it. So you want to make sure you're right on where your uh, yeast wants it to be. I'm going to grab my yeast, which I keep in the fridge. All right, so I have it open here. Um, some people add the whole pack. Some people add half a pack. Uh, this one pack is good for up to five gallons. Um, I just throw in the whole pack. Um, I think it can taint flavor just a bit if you don't rack it off right away. I'm going to add the whole pack. Um, you can give it a quick stir, just a little bit. You don't need to, though. Uh, anyways, I'm going to be monitoring uh, the temperature, making sure it stays uh, right around 35, 37 degrees Celsius. Um, let it sit for 15 minutes or until it starts foaming really well. Um, sometimes it starts sooner, sometimes it takes longer. Uh, 15 minutes is the sweet spot usually though. So I'll keep an eye on the temperature here. You can already see it uh, starting to dissolve in there. Um, and then in 15 minutes we'll add it into our must. Alright, so it's been just over 15 minutes now. Um, a lot, of, a lot of the time when you see videos like this, you'll see the yeast really puff up uh, if you're using uh, 50 milliliters of water. I'm using a cup here. Um, of water so you won't see as vigorous bubbling but I like to give it a good start in the actual must itself with the uh, nutrient and energizer already added as well. Um, so I'll bring it on over to our carboy and we'll add it in. Alright so there's still a bit of foam on top of our must but it should be okay. Open that up, get our clean funnel here. We're going to slowly and carefully add it in. All right. And that is essentially our last step. Now we'll just uh, top it off with a bit more spring water here. Um, you should get it up just like uh, almost a centimeter below your handle there. All right, so the next step is uh, really easy. A little bit of vigorous exercise. Cap it off just like that and give it a good shake for five minutes, uh, stopping every two minutes or so to let it air off if it needs to. Um, and then we'll add our airlock. 
Uh, I'm not going to film myself shaking for five minutes. Uh, you'll just have to trust that I did it. All right. So if you manage to get through the five minutes of shaking without throwing out your back or getting a cramp, uh, this is what it should look like. Some foam at the top. That's perfectly okay. Um, so this next step uh, is it's very important that your hands in particular are sanitary because you're going to be dealing with the rubber stopper. And take your rubber stopper, which should be sanitized already. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I've had some issues with these stoppers. If you put it in this way, they have a tendency to get loose and not keep a good seal. Um, I found a solution to this, or I'm sure somebody else has done it already. But if you put it in this way, it has a much tighter seal. However, same thing can happen just reverse in that it still pops out this way. You'll feel that getting it in is a much tighter fit than the other way around. Which is good, you want a tight fit. But if you do it just like that, it still has a tendency to pop out. So I'll show you my uh, solution to this. Once you've filled up your airlock to its designated lines like this, just slip it in so it has a good tight seal. Pop your cap on top and grab some electrical tape. It doesn't have to be electrical tape, but uh, something that uh, bends or I don't know the word I'm looking for. Has a tight seal, you know, around. And this is just a precautionary step, just to keep that stopper in place. It's not creating a seal. It's literally just holding that stopper where it needs to be. Once you've got that on, that pop, that uh, cork, or a rubber stopper isn't going anywhere. But anyways, this is a sealed carboy that is ready to begin fermenting now. Um, after about 16 hours is I think the uh, general amount of time that you should start seeing bubbling. Um, if you don't see bubbling within 24 hours, you probably don't have a good seal or uh, maybe your yeast didn't activate correctly. Or At this point, you're basically home free as far as uh, actual steps goes. You want to set it aside in a place that's uh, nice and dark um, and relatively cool. Around 20 degrees is uh, the uh, sweet spot. Once you see it stop bubbling, take a hydrometer test. If you have a hydrometer, I have one in the mail that I'm going to use to test it. Um, and I'll, I'll probably make a video on actually testing alcohol percentages to ensure that your fermentation is complete. Um, after two weeks, you're going to rack it off using your siphon that I showed. Um, I'll probably include those in different videos. Um, this video is already pretty long. So uh, if you guys have followed me this far, uh, thank you for watching. I hope this has been informative. Uh, I just thought I'd take you guys along for the ride and show you some of the troubles and some of the experiences I've had in brewing meat at home. Uh, it's a really fun project to do at home, super, super easy. Um, and once you have all, all this equipment, um, you can brew a bunch of different types of alcohol. You can do wines, you can do beers, you can do ciders and kombuchas and so it's just, it's just a fun hobby to have at home. And uh, in the end, once you have all your equipment and you've made enough batches, you most definitely save money. And uh, the longer you let it sit, the better it gets. So um, if you let it sit for six months, you're looking at a very uh, flavorful, really good wine or mead, um, which in my opinion, it's, it's really cool because you've made it with your own hands. Um, so I've had a great time learning to make mead. I'd love to upload more videos uh, about my experiences as I continue on, but other than that guys, uh, I hope you've uh, enjoyed this very belated return and uh, hopefully see you in some future videos. Thanks so much for watching. Just as a really quick side note here, um, this is an airlock that I've had sitting on my first batch of mead. This one's been sitting for about three days now uh, and the uh, airlock has just started to slow down. After about a day you should see a really vigorous bubbling in your airlock um, and actually in your bottle if you can pick it up there you should see bubbling as well. Um, it's going to be pretty cloudy to begin with. Um, I've wrapped this one just in a old towel to keep it dark in the uh, hallway I have here. I have this light turned off most of the time. Um, but you can see the carboy is a little cloudy in there with the uh, dying yeast and stuff. Um, I like having it this way because then I can check on the bottom there and see how much has settled to the bottom uh, in regards to dead yeast. Um, so I'll set the uh, 
new carboy that I've just created uh, beside it here. Wrap it up in a towel as well. And uh, I'll up update you guys in about two weeks when these two are finishing up.